Well, Chuck Meyer was the, the leading guiding light for the, the whole laboratory concept, certainly, that had an operation, wasn't it? Well, it really goes back another step to Reno Sales, because Reno Sales hired Chuck Meyer to come and, and set up the Butte Lab. El Salvador Lab evolved from the success of the Butte Lab as its predecessor. We were able to sell the idea of establishing a Salvador laboratory to help uh, primarily develop criteria, new criteria for exploration for porphyry coppers. Butte, there were lab geologists who, who did just but, worked in the lab and were not part of the operations. And whereas at El Salvador, we were, you know, everyone had, did everything. And, uh, it was, you know, our responsibilities were all towards production, mm -hmm. assisting the operations, and also, of course, building this model, trying to put together the anatomy of a porphyry copper that could be use, used in, in exploration for more. Of course, all uh, new hires, geology hires in those days, I think, did their time in Butte, learned how the basic Butte mapping system. So I was sent for three months to, to Butte, and uh, John was on vacation and uh, came through Butte, and that's where we met, as I was already on, on the road to El Salvador. So there were five of us, I guess, then, that first time, Frank, you, me, uh, uh, Alvaro, Alvaro Silverone, and there. Bill Kramer. So five, five was there. Yeah, that was about as big a staff as we ever had. We had without consciously thinking about it, one of the, the drives for the whole work program and what helped decide what to do next was the fact that we were trying to document an evolutionary history of 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 one porphyry copper. Uh, evolutionary history and other porphyries would be in the effect variations on the same theme. And, and to what extent was that an initial concept? That's certainly what evolved. You no, know, that's from what that. I'm saying. And, that's uh, what it was. What was, but that helped drive uh, what to do uh, to understand uh, understand doing this study on sulfide zoning and working on the early, carefully selecting the early, early background mineralization as one component of the story and the alteration studies uh, as another component of when did the alteration occur with respect to the sulfides and the background work on anhydrite is something that runs through the whole history of the deposit work on sulfide zoning and its relationship to to relic sulfides in the overlying leach capping so that you, we were able to deduce what the original sulfide uh, mineralogy and zoning in the leach capping was by, by studying the relic sulfides in a microscope systematically and using these uh, technical guys like Wilson Galvis to do the, the precise point counting of it, which generated patterns of, in the leach capping that could be traced downwards into the sulfide, below the top of sulfides. The product sulfides, things that John started doing, thought of and doing that I had never heard of. And I've always been puzzled, really, how little uh, People are using it in Chile, but when you sort of, we threw that out just sort of as a, a one-liner, not thinking that, you know, hoping no one would really pick it up, and people didn't for a long time. I think the application has, uh, has uh, fallen way short of its potential around the industry in general, don't you think, John? Yeah, part of the reason, of course, is you have to have a leech capping it exposed in order to do it. When you're in the field you're exploring and you just examine your prospect, you see a pattern, you see certain rocks, you see certain events. And, and until we had gone through this process, well, first at Butte, and then, but then at Sourdough, to try to get it, get it so greatly increased our ability to, to just to interpret, you know, the, the small little exposures that you often see, or lots of exposure, but uh, without uh, you know, any of the three-dimensional stuff. And it's much better basis for trying to visualize those things and interpret it and, and figure out what's missing. You know, what to certainly 
uh, recognizing multiple centers and, and their good parts and bad parts, one of the most important things in exploration is when you're seeing something and it, eh, it looks pretty marginal, lots of people looked at it, well, is there a much better portion of this system? How do we, what's our confidence that there might be and where might it be? We learned how to look through the overprinting of, of later events that were not really productive as far as introducing much copper. Three quarters of the copper at El Salvador came in the early potassic stage of biotization and, and low sulfur sulfide mineralization at the upper levels of the deposit were overprinted by pyritic, sericitic mineralization that, that really brought very little copper to the table, but, but which uh, wiped out much of the texture of the... There are systems, many systems, particularly much of the Arizona systems, for instance, where a lot of the copper, most of the copper is comes in the late stages. The early stages are really low intensity. They may be highly altered. You know, the core at San Manuel uh, is intensely altered, very, very low intensity uh, copper sulfides, high copper ratio, but the copper comes in this later phase. And we, and there are a number of deposits around the place like that. And, and uh, John Prophet has come up with some interesting concepts as what this relates to the depth of emplacement. But that, in my mind, is still one of the major questions in, in porphyry coppers and in evaluating porphyry copper exploration. John's new ideas on, on the, not, not exactly the depth of emplacement of the porphyry itself, or body, but the depth of which the magma chamber underneath was differentiating yeah. and, yeah. and generating the juice. It makes a difference if it was deep right. or shallow in the character of the mineralization and the size, probably the size of the, of the deposit too.